I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today at TEDx Bloomsbury. You might see a disaster on the news and wonder what it would be like if it happened to you, or maybe you've lived through a disaster. In fact, because of the pandemic, most of us have lived through a disaster. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how disasters affect people living in informal settlements in cities of the global south and what is being done to address them. I'm also going to tell you about what is actually needed to tackle the root problem of disasters. So now, more than half of the world's population is living in cities. And these cities are densely populated. And in cities of the global south, many people don't have access to the basic infrastructure to protect them from hazards. At the same time, climate change and ecosystem destruction are making hazards more severe. So what we're seeing is that disasters are affecting more and more people every year. We say that risk is systemic, that is, it's inherent in society, in the ways we live all together, in the ways we build our cities, in our politics, in the inequalities that exist in society. As the pandemic has shown, we, as one community on this planet, are only as strong as our weakest link. So disasters take on different forms. There are the big disasters that you might see on the news, like earthquakes, or like the explosion that happened in the port of Beirut last summer. Then there are the smaller scale disasters. These might affect neighborhoods or parts of cities. And these disasters though, are equally devastating for those who are affected by them. Then we have the everyday disasters that cumulatively have huge impacts on people's health and on their well-being, like diarrheal disease that affects millions around the world every day that don't have access to water and sanitation. So there's things we can do to prepare for disasters, not only for the rich or exposed global capital, that may be protected by insurance or by government bailouts, but also for those least able to withstand disasters. Because it's only when those who are most vulnerable are able to withstand, can we say that resilience is achieved. So resilience, or the ability to bounce back, is a term that's often criticized for its neoliberal connotations. If inequality persists, and some people don't have enough access to food or money or resources to live well, is bouncing back after disaster enough? Surely resilience is about a trajectory towards a state that is better than what is now. So there's a lot that we're doing in cities to prepare for disasters. We can build roads into settlements so that people can, emergency vehicles can access if there's a fire. We can site housing away from areas where there are frequent flooding. We can tackle air pollution or try to tackle air pollution. We can make welfare payments uh, for families in times of crisis. So there are things that can be done and things that are being done to tackle disasters. But in fact, the way our cities are built makes tackling these issues in a socially just manner more complicated. So consider Kampala, Uganda, for example. This East African city is built over a series of hills. And not only do people live on the hills, but they also live in the low-lying areas of the city. These areas are affected by floods on, al for, on almost a daily basis during the rainy season. And this flooding causes really bad things for people, illnesses, skin conditions, 
people's businesses are disrupted for days. And there have even been really sad situations of children being swept away in the floodwaters. So many people might choose to resettle from these low-lying areas if they had the financial means to, but in fact, few can afford to. And despite the risks of flooding, the reasons for staying in these central areas of Kampala are compelling. Uh, inexpensive access to food if from markets. Uh, running a business is fairly inexpensive with low overheads and a lot of footfall. If you need to transport around the city, this is fairly inexpensive. And schools are more available and better in the central city. So even if people wanted to resettle to the outskirts of the city, there are few jobs there. Access to come to work in the central city is too expensive for the transport. So in fact, even if people do make the move outside, many end up having to move back to the central city later because it's just not affordable. So the question then is, what can we do to build resilience when people already live in areas exposed to hazards, like in these low-lying areas of Kampala. Consider Waze Three Parish, for example. This is one of these settlements in these low-lying areas. The Kampala Capital City Authority has done a number of things to try to address the flooding. They've built drainage infrastructure in key transport areas of the city, which has meant the drainage ditch at the lowest area of the settlement has been improved. They've also built small drains through the settlement that would enable floodwaters to move into the larger drains and negotiated with homeowners, some of whom have agreed to move their houses away from the drainage infrastructure to accommodate these new drains. At the same time, there's a lot of things being done by communities in Boise 3. There are business associations, there are savings groups, there are youth groups, and a lot of these organizations are involved in doing things to help improve the environment in Boise 3, things that the municipality is not able to do, like solid waste collection. There's a number of groups who are involved now, for example, in making energy briquettes out of household waste. So solid waste collection not only keeps the drains clear when the floodwaters come, but also provides income earning opportunity. Households also do things to try to mitigate the flooding problem, putting plinths, raised plinth at the door of their house, or even building the houses on top of mounds of soil to keep them away from the floodwaters. Well, it's possible to make improvements to the flooding situation in places like Boise 3. It's really the deeper issues that need to be addressed to actually fix the problem. So access to a good income, for example, was a key election issue in Uganda a few months ago. So as I've been saying, while we can do things to address disasters, they're really only a band-aid solution unless we can actually address these deeper issues. So heat stress is also a major problem for many people living in informal settlements. In Dhaka, Bangladesh's largest city, there are literally millions of people living in informal settlements who live in one-room houses. And many of these houses don't even have a window, only a door. And so they can't have a cross ventilation within their house. They may have access to some energy to have a fan for a few hours a day. But really, heat stress has a major impact on people. It affects their ability to work and to learn with exhaustion. People lose their stocks if they're selling vegetables when it's really, really hot. And people have longer term health impacts from this problem. So there are some things that can be done to combat the heat problem, like design solutions within houses. Um, there's also interesting examples of 
using parametric insurance. So when there's heat over a number of days, people will receive a payout for losses of, to their income. But if you ask people in Dhaka, living in these informal settlements, what they really need, they'll tell you they need a decent house. Because a decent house will enable them to really live better and to solve this problem of heat, for example, because a decent house will also have access to water and energy infrastructure. And for people living in informal settlements, the house is not only a place to live, but it's often a place of production or the storage of goods that one is selling. So the house is a really key problem to building resilience to disasters. So what I'm saying is that resilience is something that is built up outside of disaster times to address normal development issues that need to be addressed in informal settlements. For example, Slum Dwellers International, or SDI, has been working for many, many years in building networks, first of all, of women's savings groups and enumerations of people living in informal settlements. And these kind of things help to give people a voice and being part of decision making in the city because they hold information about their settlement and who they are and how many people they are and what conditions they live in. And this SDI network now covers 32 countries and 478 cities, millions of people and thousands of informal settlements. So where does this all bring us? In answering the provocations of this TEDx conference on resilience amidst disruption, is bouncing back enough or should we adapt together and how do we do that? My answer after working on this topic for many years is that building resilience to disasters is a continuous and iterative process of actions that are done by many individuals over a lot of time, and it's not just a one-off thing. But to really address the deeper issues that create vulnerabilities and that lead to disasters, we need to address those underlying things that make people vulnerable, such as tenure insecurity, access to a good income, access to healthcare, and to address the politics that create these situations. So while disasters that you may see on the TV might seem far away, I think what the pandemic has shown to me and challenges like climate change is that actually we are all one community together and all affected by each other. And therefore, addressing inequalities is something that we all have a role to play in in our daily life, in our work, and in our future practice. Thank you.